get invited to speak, um, and I'm, every time every, every time I'm invited to speak, I'm told to speak about wealth building. I suffer from something called the imposter syndrome. Do you guys understand the imposter syndrome? Where sometimes you look back, someone might knock you and tell you, hey, 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 we know your story, you, you're not what you think you are. Um, so um, many people tell me to talk about wealth and I, 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 I ask myself, why me? I didn't go to school to study wealth. Um, a common guy from Dago who grew up selling meat in a butchery. And so every time, every time I think of myself, that's who I am. Um, your local guy who at 18, I couldn't speak like Wamoshe, I wish when I was 18, someone told me that lesson. At 18, I was, playing, I, was, I was probably cutting my skin at rugby, at Impala getting knocked around and drinking heavily and dancing on tables. There's nothing <laughs> unique about me. So I, I would never have thought about money. I had an allowance of 200 bob from my mother, but my money used to go to Kani, like all of us. I can see some of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so when I, some of the stories I'll tell you, Will not be, you don't expect anything profound. There's no secret to building wealth. The fact that I can share my story is the only thing that I can do. To try and, 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 and show you that there's no magic. The only thing that I'd want to be profound is the, time, the issue of time and resilience. Those are the only things that I'll tell you. If I can even stop this presentation and tell you time and resilience. That issue of waiting for that big contract, that one big gig, doesn't work. Wealth comes as a process of building, uh, or, or a process of time and resilience. So the, the best way to get into this is to tell you guys my story. Um, I made a decision a long time ago when I started speaking that I'd be as candid as possible. So I talk about my failures mostly than my successes because most of the people who speak in these sort of events never talk about their, their errors. They never talk about how they screwed up. They, 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 it, it's, my former boss used to call it the African shyness. I talk about what I have and I talk about what I've lost and I've talked about mistakes that I made because there's no purpose of me coming to, 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 to paint a picture here that um, will be sort of fake if it doesn't tell you where the, where the holes are. I hope technology didn't let me down. Right, 12 years ago, or oh, 13 years ago, I went into business with nothing, zero. I had just lost my job, I had a mortgage, and I had young children. I went to business with zero. Today my, uh, uh, today my business is worth three billion shillings, 12 years later. Um, and this value has come from setting up an insurance group. We, I, I own five insurance companies in East Africa. Um, and as I said, yeah, 12 years ago, I was worth nothing. In addition, I've invested in other businesses. Some of those businesses you probably know. If you are young, you probably know I'm in music. Um, I have a controlling interest in a company called Pine Creek Records. Uh, I produce uh, local music. We've gone across borders. You probably have danced to my music if you like music. I've produced uh, people from like Nikki, Mr. Lenin, Dij. I've worked with uh, many people. My current cash cow is a gentleman called Antonio Sol, whose album is flying off the shelves. Please buy it. <laughs> Um, and um, it, it's something that I like. I did music in my time. I'll tell you some of the stories. I used to be a break dancer, those guys who know me. Uh, I, my first paying gig was in 1984, where there's a movie called Breaking that was showing at uh, 20th Century. And I and, and two buddies of mine went to 20th Century Fox, a company I hope that still exists. And we told them the only way you can get guys to come and watch the, the movie, since they haven't seen it, is to get break dancers to dance outside. So, so <laughs> During the school holidays, I used to dance outside Kenya Cinema <laughs> and outside 20th, and I used to earn 100 shillings a weekend. It was a lot of money, because I used to walk to Wimpy Kenyatta Avenue to meet another girl there, then we go to Kani with that money. It, it, it didn't help. Um, the, the second business I invested into after Resolution is a company called Absolute Security. Um, one time in my life, I worked for a company called Ears Medivac. I don't know if some of you guys can remember it. Ears Medivac was, was a medical company that was housed under a company called Ears Security. Ears Security no longer exists. It was acquired by KK Security some years ago. We used to have yellow and blue colors. 
So when I was there, I used to sit in management meetings of the group. I didn't understand security, but I learned about it. So once uh, my insurance business picked up, I took some money out and invested in a security company. So if you see vehicles written absolute security, uh, it's one of my businesses. Um, after, uh, three years ago, I divested from, uh, from insurance because I was forced to by the regulator. You, in, if you understand the Insurance Act in Kenya, you cannot uh, own an insurance company alone. You, um, so I was told that you can't be a shareholder, CEO, director, chief bottle washer, everything. So you need, to sell, <laughs> you need to sell some of your shares. And I took that money out and put up a small fund. And I made, I made a decision that instead of taking this money and um, putting it away, why don't I invest in people like me? Young guys who had just started, they're struggling or they, they lack his capital. And, and out of that, I formed two companies, a company called Brown Oak Holdings and a company called Redwood Capital. And these companies listen to ideas and someone, so people approach me, they want, they're looking for capital and mentorship and I invest in their businesses. Um, and I'll talk about that one business that called, called, called Consumer Benchmark as my last point as I go ahead. So, my, my story, as I said, is basic. When someone looks at this, I'm sure the thing that jumps at you is 3.2 billion. It is not cash that I have in the bank. It is my net worth in the businesses that I own. Okay? It's not, don't, don't, don't go tweeting and telling people, Peter Duat is a billionaire worth 3.2 billion. No, 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 no. Uh, this, I, I felt this was profound for people to try and understand how did you build this with nothing? I started with zero. I don't, most people would think maybe I come from a very rich family. No, 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 no. My dad was a butcher, my mother is a butcher. She's still doing meat in the Goretti. We, we had a slaughterhouse, we had butcheries. That's what I did in my school time, during school holidays. Since I was 12, I used to sell meat. And if I ever sold you bones, please forgive me. <laughs> right, I'm what you call a corridor investor, a corridor entrepreneur. A corridor entrepreneur is someone who starts something, makes a success of it, and use the proceeds to invest in other businesses. I'm different from what you call a serial entrepreneur. I know most of us here are entrepreneurs in our own ways. Kenyans, is it something that we have is entrepreneurship. You find most of you guys have a side hustle. Either you have a shares in number three, you have a kiosk, or you have a kabak garden in where you live that you sell greens. All of us have side hustles. So Kenyans, don't, we, we, we don't lack the understanding of business. So I decided a long time ago that what I want to be and how, how I'll build my wealth is from entrepreneurship. There are many other ways of building wealth, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So, um, I, I just mentioned about Redwood Capital, the venture capital fund. Small, we are doing deals of between $250,000. No, the ceiling, $250,000. So I have investments, companies that have invested $700,000. That's the smallest and the largest is $250,000. And um, two companies, or two of those companies are in technology, one is in education and one is in real estate. Right, the story of, my story is intertwined with, with the resolution and um, how I made it is, and, and the story I want to tell you, how you start a company without money is the way I planned my financing. One thing is, my girlfriend say, call it, I'm very cocky. I knew I was good at what I did. I was very, very good at what I did. So when I, when I wrote my business plan, I knew it was sound. But I made, I made the first mistake everyone makes. I went to commercial banks looking for money. You all know that Kenyan commercial banks don't lend money to startups. I did not know, and I was 32. So, <laughs> so Wamoshi, you're on the right path. Kenyan banks don't lend startups. So the, my, my first, what I did is I went to angels, and I'll talk about how I went to angels. I propagate my gospel everywhere I go. When I lost my job, I was, I, I, one day, we used to wash cars with my neighbor and just chat about uh, business. And my neighbor asked me, are you still working for AAR? I said, no, 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 I left. Um, what are you doing now? Um, I want to set up a health insurance company. And we were just washing our cars on a Saturday morning with our hangings and, um, and, and he asked me, okay, so what's your plan? He said, I told him my biggest issue right now is the fact that um, I don't have capital. <coughs> And I'm worried if this gig doesn't work, I'll have to go back to employment. And that conversation led to another conversation told me there's someone I need to introduce you to. And the next day he called me and introduced me to someone who was in the same industry as I, and I gave, I gave them a business plan, and uh, they made a decision to invest, but I'll talk about that going forward. So 
The decision to start a company without money is what I want you guys to think about, that it's possible. That there are people out there who want to finance great ideas, who are looking for people with energy and passion, and they're willing to, they're willing to put money into the business. So if I can offer that counsel today, I think my work will be done. So well, the first thing that we do when we go to look for money, it is, um, sorry, is to give away your business. Because an investor is giving you money, you give, them, you give away your business. So the question I'll ask is why give away your energy? Okay, you're going to work uh, every day, many hours, and you know the, the folly of an entrepreneur is the amount of hours that you put in, and then you don't own it. So as you struggle, struggle to find financing, you're very, very tempted to give away your business. That was one of the issues that I was very worried about. It wasn't my idea, I had a mentor, and I remember I told you that, um, that uh, my mother was in business, so she did a, a bit of, of advising me. So I didn't realize at that time that the financing plan is the key, is the key way of how to build your, to, to build your business. And my net worth has come from how I structured, I structured my, my, my business. So one of the things that I did was dream. I have never stopped dreaming. Many people, including people who work for me, normally tell me, oh, feel, you're so rich. And when I tell them I have, but I have hardly scratched the, the direction that I want to go, and I tell them I want to retire at 50, I have five years to go. I want to retire. If I go beyond that, maybe two years. Because I, I also feel you can't build wealth and not enjoy it. Okay? Um, I'm not struggling to pay school fees right now. My daughter is in university because I had, I had put a plan for it. I'm not struggling to pay a mortgage because I own my own home. But what's the purpose of me making money and then die with money in the bank? Okay, and I'll tell you guys, I'm not building wealth for my kids. They have to make their own money. <laughs> they have to make their own money. My youngest daughter, when we fly anywhere in the world, she keeps complaining, why do you fly business class and you put me at the back? <laughs> and I told her, you have not earned the right to fly business class. There are people who find me mean, but it's true. If I entertain her flying business class today, what will she aim to? What, would she, what is it she will aim to? It's sad that I have to go to the same destination with her. <laughs> if she could go to another destination, it would help. So, and these are, these are basic lessons that you have to teach your kids. Okay? Most wealthy people produce very badly behaved children. Okay? And it's, it's, it's true. So th th there's some things you'll have to do. So that thing of, it's so unfair. R right now we are fighting about a phone. My daughter doesn't have a phone. And she keeps, she, she keeps telling me, oh, I feel so bad. All my friends have phones in class. I'm the only one. I told her, you're unique. They will find you unique as you grow old. Because <laughs> you can't tell her the lesson that when I was your age, that doesn't work. So you have to do it now. Those are some of the things you, you'll have to do. Sometimes you have to deny your kids things, not being mean, as a life lesson. You remember our folks were always broke. Yeah. Can you remember your parents ever saying, I have money? Okay. That was the lesson. What we have forgotten now that we have gotten kids is that, that, that we want to show off to our children. You cannot show off to your kids. Okay? Don't, don't show your kids that you have money. If I hear my kids telling, telling their friends that uh, I am rich, I, it, 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 it bothers me. Recently, we had a boy who came to visit my son, and he stayed over. I don't know what my son thinks I am, because I, I was, at one time, I was a team manager of the Kenya rugby team. I just quit uh, that recently. She, he believed I owned the team. So this, boy, <laughs> so this boy was telling me, so you own an insurance company and you own the Kenya rugby team. I said, oh, no, no, back up. I don't own the Kenya rugby team. I was a manager. So, <laughs> so I think when they're that age, they're thinking manager is the same as, as owner. Okay. So there's, there's lessons every day. Right. I want to talk about smart financing. Back in 2000, a smart lawyer and a smart mother so it, so it that I started my business well. Um, when I decided to start my business, my mother told me, you do not understand law, and I know you and money. You don't know how to manage money. I don't even believe I'm a good money manager now. What I aim to do because I'm not a good manager is make sure that I make so much more than I'm spending because okay, I, I, do, I do tend to spend. Okay? And that's a, that's a basic lesson. Make more than you then you can spend. It's always a journey. If you slow down here, it catch up and then the book. 
the bank becomes your body. And I, and I need to be honest with you guys, I've been auctioned twice. I've been auctioned twice. I lost my first house through an auction. So my story, as I told you, you chasing money. So back to my mother. My mother drops out of school in, in standard eight. So she's not educated. She didn't have a degree in economics. She didn't have a company called Centonomy like Washeke. She has never gone to school, but she, what she has understand, understood is how to manage money. And you do not ignore the older people in the lessons. So when I, when I, when I, told, when I, when I told my mother, look, I, I, want, I, want, I want to start my, my company and I want to get out of employment. She told me two things about you. You cannot manage money. That's number one. Second, you don't understand law. So I urge you to go and sit with a lawyer first. That is the best lesson I've ever been given in my career. So I went and got the, the best and brightest lawyer. He's no longer in that business now. He does construction. Um, <laughs> okay? And he assisted me in putting the legal work. Because I had the concept. I understood insurance. I had served 12 years in the insurance industry. I understood what the what pitfalls are. The only thing that I didn't have was money. So I, I, I did a very simple thing. I decided. I decided that I would keep the common stock of the business and issue something called preferred shares so that I control, I control the business. I had a partner, a, a lady friend of mine. Uh, she's a pilot. I don't know how she ended up uh, getting insurance, and we started the business with her. And I, I, I take you back. We didn't have any coin. All we had was dreams. I always dreamt that one day I'll own a big brand that everyone is walking into and putting in, putting in money. At that point, I wasn't sure it was insurance, but I wanted to own a big brand. And, and, and I knew that I had to fulfill that dream. So what I did is, um, so when the lawyer advised me, yes, split your stocks into two. Take the common stock, the shares of the company, and own that, and issue preferred stock to investors. Please know that time there are no investors. I'm just thinking that there are people out there who, who are willing to, to, to put money. Um, okay. And that idea worked. So I decided to follow those steps, as you can see there. So I issued 400,000 shares of common stock at a par value of $4,000, and I owned that. Then I authorized uh, 1,000 shares of five, what you call non community uh, preferred stock at $100. And that was what I sold to the investors who came. So although there were investors, they really didn't own the business. They always knew they had preferred shares. They were the ones who would be paid first if anything was to go wrong. But they, I, I kept the ownership of, um, of the business. And I don't want to get into calculations. Um, okay. So my partner and I, she, she took 100,000 shares and I took 200,000 shares. Please note when you're doing this, it's just a paper. We don't own a business. This, you draw these things in advance. It's, it's, it's what, what is called financial planning. Please note I don't have a job that time when I'm doing this. And I have a mortgage and I have school fees. My oldest daughter was in primary school. So, um, I, and I used to walk out of the house every morning in a suit. Every morning. You have to act like you own it. <laughs> Never go to an investor looking like you're begging. Many times when I used to walk around seeing, looking for investors, I had no money for lunch. Okay? But you have to fake it until you make it. You have to. Five minutes, if you walk into my office to try and pitch me an idea, in five minutes, I can tell what you're about. And if you show desperation, I'll screw you over, I'll tell you. I will come, I can own your business. You better ha how come with a plan. That's one thing investors look for. The second one is passion. Does this person understand what they're talking about? Can you answer questions about that business on the fly? How much research have you done? I had all that. So, the first investor I went to see, and I'll tell you this story, told me to meet him at Norfolk, okay? I had to time when I go in, because I could have afforded to pay the bill, eh? So I had to time that I enter after him and find his order. Because I thought if he finds me there, I have to pay the bill. Those sort of, those are, those, those in, in my can I suit, those, those tricks I've, I've had to learn. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> so, to find investors. I turned to people in the field that I knew very well, insurance. I had, had, had 12 years experience in the business and, and, and I understood the insurance people, especially CEOs who were looking to diversify their wealth and all they were looking for was someone with energy. So 
so I went out I had, and, and having worked when I was working for, for my, my, the two companies I worked for, I built a reputation of delivery. So if I committed to a client that I'll deliver, I used to deliver. So the issue of integrity was key. And, and so I went to those people, especially who had wanted to employ me. There are companies, when I was working for AR, who used to try and poach me. Come, we'll make you CEO, we'll give you shares. I went to them and I told them, now that you wanted to employ me, why don't you invest in this company that I want to set up? It, it actually demonstrates value. So the first investor I tried told me that I have my investment plan backwards. Okay, the first investor, and I actually ended up buying land from many, many years. You probably know um, Erastas Moravi. He was once the CEO of uh, Cobb Bank. Yeah, when I, I approached him and we had a drink and I gave him my business plan and he had even committed to invest. But he told me, no, I, I, you have your investment plan backwards. He said, you and your partner are managers of the business. We as investors are the ones who are putting in the money and then you're not, you don't want to give us the, the stock in the business. And I tried to tell him, look, I'm investing, my, I'm investing time. I'm investing my knowledge. I'm investing my network. That surely has a value. And anyway, he eventually walked away. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that he regrets this, but he walked away. Um, and I, I went to the next guy. Okay. So that was, which, that was my reply to him. I want to take 75% of the business because I'm investing my time, and time is money. Okay, so he didn't invest. Three other people, though, who are in insurance business, came to me and, um, and invested. They gave me the money. They bought the stock that I was talking about, 10,000 shares at $100 each. And over the years, I've gone increasing the ownership. Those three people, by 2005, I had bought them out. Uh, by then, by the way, I had lost my house. I was renting. Um, and... Um, over the years, as it, it went on, at one time, I ended up owning the company 100%. A lot of venture capitalists, even now if you go to them, would agree with that investor. If you go to an investor, to a venture capitalist today, they will refuse. They'll tell you, no, 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 no. We want to invest on the common stock. We want to own the business. And, and they can come in and take over your company. But, as, but, but I, was, I was very lucky to have had that guidance from my mentor, from my mother, and from that lawyer. The person doing the work in any company should have an incentive to do a good job. And the only way you can do that is by giving them equity. So I want to talk about investing in entrepreneurs because that's where this country is going to. So if you're going to business, you have to believe that you can make your dream happen. Okay? I, even today, I believe if I can lose everything and still be able to accomplish my dreams. And I, I believe I can accomplish my, my dream faster than I did. So 12 years later, I've accomplished this dream, but if, if this business was to end, I still believe I have the capability to set up again and start. So in 2007, five years after the initial financing, we were able to buy back all the stock from the original investors. We bought them out, and then they made 3.75 times of the money that they put in. I can give you the numbers. The investors put in 28 million shillings. They sold out 105 million shillings. When I meet them in the streets today, they are very happy. And by the way, when, they were, when we were buying them out, I still didn't have money. Mm -hmm. So 28 million, and uh, they, they got 105 million. So think about it. If they had taken that money, because they were rich, if they had taken that money and put it in a bank account for five years, and that time they could have gotten a fixed deposit rate of 10%, they would have made 45 million shillings. So by investing in an entrepreneur, they made a bigger spread. But what is it they did? They took a risk. Risk, return. You always need about that. Entrepreneurship is about taking risks and in, 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 in taking that opportunity and making a return. So they made an extra 60 million just by taking that risk on me. Today, as I tell you, many times I meet them, we chat about, about, about business, they are doing other things, and they always tell people, this guy made us some money. One of them decided to hold back on some shares. And he had put in 4 million shillings in 2002. I've just bought him out in March this year for 89 million. His 4 million is 89 million shillings. And I had to buy him out because there's something I'm, I'm, I'm doing about the business, which I'll tell you next. Right. So at this time, around 2007, 2008, the company started to prosper. And then we did uh, some stock splits, uh, which we still continue to do today. So the wisdom of, the, of, uh, of, the, of me doing the investment the way I did it has, has shown me that I'd made the right decision. 
I've agreed a couple of weeks ago to sell majority control of the business for $19.3 million. Because first of all, um, the regulator demands that I, I can only own up to 20%. You, you understand banking and insurance. I've just signed a deal to sell it for $19.3 million. And by this time, okay, the, each, each investor who put 10,000 shillings in 2002, is that particular stock is now worth 24 million. That share is worth 24, worth 24 million. So there are they're, they're, they're investors who are leaving. One of my investors is leaving with $6.9 million. Okay? And he has not changed. He's still the same way when he gave me that 10,000 of those many years ago. It's a good investment when you invest in an, in an entrepreneur. But you have to dream and dream big. So how do you go about creating wealth? Creating wealth is investing in the future. Okay? Right, right now, I'm busy investing in a new dream. Because some of you may be looking at me and thinking, okay, now that you've been paid $19.3 million, what are you going to do? That money is gone. Please don't send tax to my house. It's gone. <laughs> that money is going to finance my future dream. And my future dream is I want to set up a whole, an integrated financial house. So you can come to me for insurance, you can come to me for investments, you can come to me for banking, an integrated finance house. That's my next dream. By the time I retire, I want Resolution Group to be an integrated financial, financial house, and I want it to be in 17 countries in Africa in the next five years. So my dream has just barely started. So if, you, if, you, if, if, if one, was, one was to think that I'm selling out so that I can take that money and do other things, I'm putting that money back into the same business. Okay? So the last time I stood on this stage, I'd been invited to speak by Marketing Society of Kenya. A gentleman who was sitting here, Timed me at the gate, at the door there. He said, oh, I, I, you said you've set up a, a small investment fund. I want to speak to you. The guy happened to be, uh, to have worked for Unilever and understood manufacturing of cosmetics, something that I don't understand. And we sat down and we spoke and he told me he's looking for someone to mentor him and someone to invest in his business. And I'm glad I took that, that initiative because uh, in December last year, I invested $100,000 into that particular business. We're projecting to do 224 million shillings by end of next year. And that's another dream. Cosmetics, everyone uses lotions, Vaseline, oils. And I know people, if you had someone come and give you that idea, you start saying, oh, but this is L'Oreal, this is um, Nice and Lovely. That market is insatiable. It's a huge, huge market. We can set 50 other companies and we'll still make money. It's the same thing as insurance. Today you might think, oh my goodness, there are 42 insurance companies in Kenya. If I start an insurance business, I'm unlikely to, to, to penetrate that market. Insurance penetration in Kenya is at 3%. We can set up another 100 companies and we still will not satisfy the market. And, and the value chain of insurance from distribution, you can set up an agency, you can join an insurance company and sell products. It's huge. It is, so even when I was coming to the market, people were asking me, why are you entering that market? First of all, all medical insurance companies used to collapse every other day. Mediplus had just collapsed. But I, th but I told you guys I was cocky. I thought I knew it all. I thought I was better than all those guys. It's very, very tough, though. So my next big thing is cosmetics. And it's a business that, I, that, I'm, that I'm funding right now. So. What lessons can I tell you guys about entrepreneurship and how to create wealth? Number one, trust your gut. Your gut will never lie to you. If you think you're right, go ahead. If you think you're wrong, don't do it. Trust your gut. And there's no secret about that. We all have that gut feeling that tells you, you know that something will, will work or will not work. That's my lesson number one. Listen to it. It will help you in building your, your fortune. You're better off sticking to what you know. I remember in the 1990s, if someone told, told you, I'm going to Dubai, you know the next thing, two weeks later, he'll be going to Mombasa to clear a vehicle. That's how it used to be. And everyone went into that market. You're employed, you take a loan, go to Dubai, bring a vehicle to come and sell. And a lot of people lost their money. It's the same thing that happened recently, quail eggs. How many people have lost money? You do not understand how to bring out those birds. Hell, I can't even identify quail if I looked at it. <laughs> but everyone wanted to enter into that market. We've gone through that. And that's how we're, we're very gullible as Kenyans. Pyramid schemes came this way. Guys, clean you out. Please invest in what you know. And let me tell you a short story. In 1999, I set up a hairdressing salon. 
It came from another, another dream. <laughs> if you think about 1995 when KTN was starting, those presenters never used to look good. <laughs> so I, I, I thought, what if I set up a company to spruce up these guys, dress them, do their hair, do their makeup and all that. And I approached Nation at that time, they had started a TV station and they gave me a contract. And I, I went and looked for petitions and with my small salary from AR, so I used, to, we, 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 I, used, I used to give them money, they go and do that. Then I realized I need to set up a farm. So I, I went to Lovington and, uh, and, and, and rented a house and I put up a place where, so those presenters used to come there, their makeup is done with my, with my petitions and, um, and then they go to, to Nation to work. It was a very good, good idea at that point. But I had to depend on people who knew that industry. What, did, what do a poor guy from Dago know about hair and makeup and, and stuff like that? So I used to be screwed by those guys. They used to, spare to, to, they used to corn me. So I decided because those petitions are still there during the day and, they, and we don't need to do that makeup, why don't I set up a hairdressing salon so that customers can come? It was, I, I branded it a spa, but really it wasn't a spa. I lost everything. And I was left with those washers and dryers and, okay. Let, my, that's the first lesson. Don't invest in something if you don't understand it. I didn't understand it. Even up to now, I don't understand it. That's lesson number one. Invest in what you know. I succeeded in insurance because I knew it. I don't think anything will surprise me in insurance today because I'm able to anticipate the changes that are going to happen because of my experience. So this gives you an advantage over someone, some, someone who doesn't know anything. Lesson number three. Sometimes your best invest investments are the ones you don't make. I am so glad I've turned, I've turned away so many things that people come to me. Yeah. There are people who will always come to you with ideas that will make you triple money, three, four times money. I go back to lesson number one, my gut tells me it's not right, I do not do it. I've lost friends who tell me, oh, you refuse to support my idea. Three years later we meet and I tell them, but your idea didn't work, okay? Make sure that you can walk away don't feel shy of walking away from something that looks good if your gut tells you it's not right. Guard your reputation. It's all you've got. If I had spent my time in the insurance industry, not, 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 not producing, being a person of, there's a lot of corruption in the insurance business, giving away kickbacks and all that, doing unethical things, people would never have invested in me. I am glad at this time that I can stand and say we have built a business worth 3 billion shillings and we've never given a kickback. And you know, in insurance, you have to give money. Many, many companies are known in this market, especially like now, right now everyone is chasing county business and all that. You have to give kickback. Do things ethically and you will succeed. I, I don't worry at night that someone will come and look for me that we did a deal, a shady deal. Okay? The other thing that I do and people criticize, I don't do, I don't do business in bars. I don't do golf. My mentor, who doesn't do either of those things, told me he does not believe that deals can be done in a bar. He does not believe it. A guy tells me, let's meet and have a drink and talk about this deal. I tell him, no, come to my office or let me come to yours and let's do this deal. Golf, just an aversion. Everyone in my family plays golf. I don't believe that you can, you can cut a deal in the golf course. Maybe you can get a, a lead, but I don't think you can cut a deal. So that, those are some of my lessons. Maybe they don't, you don't agree with them, but that's my lesson. So, reputation. You've heard this thing that, that Warren Buffett said. It's commonly quoted. It takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Okay? If you think about that, you'll always do things differently. Okay. When I, well, the things that I used to do in my 20, when I was 25, playing rugby for Impala, I can't do them now. Because some of you guys will start thinking, and that's my insurer. Mm -hmm. right? So sometimes, like for example, I love to have dreads and wear shorts to work. <laughs> Looks nice. But I can't do it. But when I'm in my 50s, you guys will see me. <laughs> okay? Because at that time, I probably wouldn't need your money. Okay? So everyone has a reputation to protect, and in business, it's very key. Banks. Actually, if you are, if you are in, 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 in risk in banking, they look more at your reputation more than other risks. So build your reputation, it's very important. People will choose to do business with you or without you based on your reputation. So build a solid reputation. Life is greater school than any university ever will be. All education gives you, academic gives you, is a foundation. 
If you come to me and tell me you have an MBA and say you're better than me because I don't have, I'll tell you. Let me tell you, the school of hard knocks is what you call street smart. Okay? Street smart. Many of, many of the investors who come, and then I've had two rounds of investment, who have come and invested in me, have a lot of money. I mean, these guys are dropping figures. The, the guy who's buying, who's bought my shares is worth $400 million. And every time he's speaking, he drops numbers like those. Okay? But why isn't he investing in himself? Because he doesn't have the local knowledge, he doesn't have my networks, he doesn't have my street smarts. Sometimes he asks me, your business has been very thin on capital since you began. How have you done it? And I tell you, street smarts. You have to be able to go to the trenches, right? To be able to trenches. And it takes a bit of smartness that school can never teach you, right? So when you see your boss pushing, pushing you, he probably has a boss on top who's pushing him. Please understand that. Aim to be above him so you can push the guys below you. When they go and get stuff, it's a cliche, but it's really, really applicable. The people who last are the people who are most resilient. Even wealthy people, when they have hard times, stick it out during that hard time. Because that's the resilience that I'm talking about. Every business has had its lean times. Over the years, in resolution, especially in the first five years, we were almost closing. Every day you're waking up, you're almost closing. I can tell you stories of how I used to go knock to the door of the bank to put in a check so that the checks that are coming don't bounce. Okay? And I can tell you my senior managers who are still with me, who left AR with me, they can tell you stories of times I couldn't afford to pay them. I used to call them to my office and tell them, guys, let's pay the juniors first. Right? And I'll pay you guys. And there are times we went two months. What I sold to those guys was my vision and my dream. And I told them, guys, we are going to be rich one day. Let's just stick this thing out. I'm not sure they believe me now, uh, because some of them may be thinking, Make you made money, but you haven't. What I've done in this deal is make sure that my management has gotten shares when, when, I, when I was selling, to make sure that they, they are protected. Two years ago, we were approached by one of the Kenyan's largest insurance companies to purchase resolution insurance. And I refused to sell for the fact, the fact that they were going to kill my brand and then get rid of my managers. That was key. These guys took a sacrifice to, 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 to quit employment and come and work with me. So one of, one of these things, one of the things if I've, if I've inculcated on them is stick it out. I keep reminding them even now. The fact that we are worth $3 billion, I mean we don't have problems. Oh, we still have serious issues. I've had to have good bankers sometimes to have good relationship with them. Sometimes even up to today, I have to go and meet CEOs of hospitals to tell them, hey, things are tight. Instead of paying you 30 days, I'll pay you over 45 days. All businesses go through a, a rough time. So stick it out. Don't go in when things get tough, you quit and try and do something else. Passion. This is a main driver. If there's any lesson you learn today, you have to be passionate about what you do. Because when things are tough, it has to be your passion that drives you. Okay? So you will, you will always succeed if you build your wealth on your passion. We work long hours. We work very, very hard. This has been a very tough week for me. I've been getting home very late. And it's because of the, of the passion that is driving me, that every day, that I'm, that this, the things that I want to achieve, and I have to put in that particular energy. So find your passion and build your wealth. OK? Many, many years ago, in 1986, I used to pretend to play the saxophone. <laughs> and I wanted to, to, to be a musician. So I went to my folks, and I told them, I don't want to go to uni because I want to be a musician. And my mother told me, musicians smoke bangi and hang out at night. There is no way you're going to business school. I'm glad that I did, go to, I did go to business school. But many, many years later, in 2005, I went back to music. Nobody who ever used to make money from music but the when, I, when I was entering into it. Right now, we have stars. We have people who are living on music because they follow their passion. And I make money from music. I can tell you, my, 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 my record label makes money. And today I laugh at my mother. I keep telling her, you know, I told you that I can make money from music. And she laughs. She says, but aren't you glad you went to university? Because probably the reason why it succeeded is because you can do some of those things that you're doing. And to set up your music business, it came from insurance. So follow your passion. Then, simple. Expect gains and losses. When I lost my house, I thought my life was finished. Okay. I lost my house and eventually lost my life. So, those, those things are all intertwined with the decisions that I made. <laughs> but, but, there was one time I thought in 2004, because I woke up one morning 
and a company called Strategies Health, I don't know if you can remember them, collapsed. And I saw news. I saw on news another medical insurer collapses and I knew I'm next. At that time, we owed hospital money and we were young and we didn't have any money. The next day when I went to the office, I had gotten calls from the top eight hospitals. Pay us everything you owe us today. Okay? The only thing, the only asset I had was my house, which I was paying a mortgage. And that house is what he saved my business. There's a guy who I always liked that house, the work, the work I, had done on it, I had done on it. And I went to him and I told him, it's time you bought it. But if you want to, it, to buy it, you have to buy it today. <laughs> okay? We went to Barclays, his bank, and he got me that commitment that day. He was wealthy. And I used that money to pay Aga Khan, Gertrude, and all those guys. And I rented that house for a while. I was a tenant for a while. I didn't tell my wife and I didn't tell my family that I was renting in my own home. <laughs> okay. Eventually, I passed by that house once in a while and I feel something. But lesson, it's not on this board. Do not have a relationship with an inanimate object. You see, Kufa and Anyumba Nagari, okay? Don't have, there are guys who, who die with these things. You leave them here. Don't have a relationship with them. So that house is gone. I can buy it now if I wanted to, okay? That saved my business. So don't expect that things go, go smooth all the time. Expect losses sometimes, okay? And that's life, okay? As long as you have your brain, you can lose everything and start again. Lose your ego. It's a lesson I tell everyone, even you go into business, leave your ego at the door. Most of us who have built a bit of wealth, has been based with leaving a lot of things. Deciding that those holidays that I used to go, those things that I used to buy, that I have to stop because at that point I couldn't afford them. I remember my eldest daughter one day telling me, why did you live here? When we were there, we could go on holiday. The company used to pay your credit card. Why did you go to employment? And up to, up to now she tells me she cannot go into business because she, she was with me during that particular path of hardships, okay? Years later, I am glad I made those decisions. When you become successful, you get things for free. Some of the whiskeys I have in my bar, expensive ones. I don't know gold, I don't drink whiskey. Those, those single bottles. I get them for free. I wait for Christmas and they come. And I put them there. When you come to my house, I give them for free. Don't go buying a single malt. I, I saw a guy the other day buy a single malt, double for 7,000 bucks. Do you know what 7,000 shillings can do? Macallan whiskey, that was the name. This guy is employed. I probably can afford that McCallum, and he paid for it. Those things are what are detrimental to your business, and don't make your business your wallet. Separate your money from the business and what you earn. So I was running a business, but I couldn't afford to buy those things. If you think about clothes, especially chicks, young guys, gadgets, the next best thing, me, I'm waiting for iPhone 16, that's when I'll buy it. <laughs> cars, I, I, I've always bought second-hand cars. Okay? It's not that I can't afford new cars. I buy a car between five, six years old. Okay? A car that is still okay. Still gives me the prestige. I get the doors open for me, the cars that I drive. But they're second hand. Those, those sort of things do not help you in building wealth. They actually drain your money. Right? When, if, if you look at lower, lower to middle, middle class, which is what all of us are, it's almost impossible to accumulate money because you want to look like that chick you saw who was dressed in that dress. You want to look like that guy you saw on TV. Please stop. Create your own style, right? You can get a tailor to make some stuff instead of going to buy those things off the rack. Because those things are draining you. And I'm glad Wamushi learned it early, right? Put away that money. Okay? If this is a problem for you, be becoming frugal, hide away. Switch off your phone on a Friday evening because the temptation is, let's go and watch Arsenal, let's go for a drink. Switch off, just learn this lesson. Switch off your phone Friday at four and switch it on on Saturday morning. Calculate the amount of money you would have saved by the next morning. <laughs> and once you do that, you will understand. Okay? That is a lesson that I learned a long time ago. And I was a hanger. Anyone who knows me, I was a boy around town. I was in all the party happening joints. If you see me now today there. 
you have to stop you have to stop when that issue i used to love people who talk about my fashion sense i used to be told i'm a, I'm a snazzy dresser I used to find, I had to find that snazzy dressing. Then I realized I am living my life for other people. I still try and dress up now, but I can afford it. Okay? Because of the, of the, of the, of the decisions that I made, with those 12 years for me was hard. Very, very hard. You've had this even from St. Tonomy's biggest lesson. I get, I get Shekhar's lessons for free. And this is how I do it. Smart. <laughs> smart. I have a program called the, 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 the Wellness Summit. Wellness Summit where we do financial health, we do spiritual health, physical health, mental health. We do that every month and I bring in people together and Sheke is the faculty. She comes and speaks about money. So I sit there and I listen to her lessons <laughs> for free. Smart. So I spoke about get rich quick schemes. Everyone is looking for that big deal. Okay? And then you rush to gamble. And I'm not necessarily saying going to the casino, but trying to gamble to make money. Quick deal. The only way to do that is to invest on a regular manner. Okay? Wealth is built on a steady pace. Don't try to, to, to live my life now if you're 32. It's impossible. Unless you've stolen that money, it's impossible. I'm 45 years old, and I still look at Chris Kruby and say, wow. Did you read his business daily? Have you guys heard the cold deal he's done? Oh, that nigger, man. You know? A lesson that I give every time. If Chris Kruby woke up with my wealth today, he probably would kill himself. He'd consider himself very poor. If Oprah woke up with Chris Kruby's wealth, she'd probably kill herself. There'll always be people doing better than you. Don't live your life like other people, right? Don't, don't start thinking, I follow this guy's path because he's made his money. Wealth comes steady. It's always clear that in your 20s, you identify your career. In your 30s, you slog, okay? In your 40s, you start building wealth. In your 50s and 60s, you start enjoying your wealth. That's a, a simple lesson. If you're thinking that that Range Rover Vogue, you will drive it in your 30s, it's owned by NIC Bank. It is not yours, you're paying the bank. <laughs> Do you think in 20 years there'll be better cars? If you're strong, you will still own those cars. Don't aim, okay? Don't aim to make that wealth like that. You can become a governor. But even then, you still have to invest something, okay? Because I think those guys are swimming in chums. So it's, it's regular. You have to put away money. You have to be frugal to be able, small amount of money, to make money. Believe wealth is possible. And that's one of the biggest issues. Open your brain and don't look at yourself and start saying, oh, if I, stu if I stood and decided because I grew up in Dago and my parents were butchers and I didn't go to changes and I didn't go to Nairobi Uni, but I'll never make money, I'd have been stuck in that mindset. Open your mindset and believe you can be wealthy. Wealth is possible for anybody. People who work for me, I want them to leave my business, to go and build wealth. Because when they start companies and they employ people, I'll insure them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's symbiotic. Believe wealth is possible. And wealth is not one single path to wealth. There are very, very many paths. Think about it. If you took, put away 20,000 shillings a month for 30 years, and if you believe in the stock exchange like I do, it's been giving you an annual return of 15% the last 20 years. You'd have a cool 136 million shillings in assets, 20,000 more in 30 years. Now, 30 years sounds like a long time, right? If I told you I've worked for 25 years, 30 years is a very short time. Okay, break it down to 20, you'll still be, be around 80 million shillings. But picture yourself in 30 years. Wouldn't it be nice to have $1.5 million sitting somewhere? Okay? And I, 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 I decided to use dollars in this particular scenario. You would not regret having done that. Okay? Start putting away. Can a lot of us afford 20 Gs? We can. If you're frugal, you can afford 20,000. Buy stocks. I'm wishing you're on the right one. Tell your mom you're thinking right. Put away 20,000 a month and put in a Robbie Talk Exchange. And you don't have to be smart, by the way. I don't consider myself a smart, tra a smart trader. You just need to look at the history of some of the stocks. The top stocks keep accumulating. Let me ask you guys. Is it rocket science that EABL will keep doing well? You guys are making them do well. Put the money in their stock. Okay? 
Is it rocket science that the banking counters in Kenya will continue doing well? We put our money there and they earn serious fees and commissions. You don't have to be very smart to, to do stock exchanges thinking which, 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 one will I, which one will I make money on, okay? You need to put money in the growth markets. Put money in the stock exchange because putting in the bank does not help you. So it comes to that. I've alluded to the issue of long-term stocks earlier. I spoke about in the beginning that investing, investing in stocks make money, helps you. Okay? The alternative to that is put money in bonds. You get a yield, an average return better than money. It beats the inflation. So always aim at that. That advantage of 6 to 7% between stocks and bonds, it's something to look forward. Stocks is risky, certainly. It's risky. But if you look at the counters that you're going to put money in, you're likely to make money. I'm not sure you, I, I'm sure you didn't think I was going to talk about the, my household. I'm, sing, I'm a single father, so I know a bit about, I shop for my house. The, th the sort of things that we buy in the supermarket, snacks, frozen foods, sodas, nuts, if, I, I mean, those things are, they, they spend your money and they're not even healthy. Spend money on the others, nuts and fruits and veggies. You, you'd be surprised at how much money you can save, okay? Let me know that a healthier diet is actually cheaper. And in Kenya, we have organic food. Americans are looking for organic food. You go to Gashi here in Kambo, you'll get, the food you're buying is organic, okay? It's cheaper. If you drive out of the city center and buy your groceries in your shags, where most of us come from there, you'll save money, the money you're giving to me and Nakumat. I know, very simple. This goes without saying. Adopt a healthy lifestyle. If you live longer, you have more time to invest. Okay? Isn't it? It's maybe because I'm in this industry, but I'm seeing atrocious numbers of guys in their 20s with utambis getting heart attacks. You're 29, what are you doing getting a heart attack? And you don't even need to go to the gym. You can run around your estate. Healthy lifestyle. You will not die young. Yeah, you can be knocked by a matatu, sorry. But you cannot be getting, you can't be getting chronic conditions, diabetes, hypertension in your 30s. Because what do you do? Nyamachoma, beer, arsenal money on a Saturday afternoon. Take your kids for a walk and save that money. Work out. If you eliminate that, those health practices, vices, alcohol, drugs, smoking, you can build up a million dollars very easily. Sit down if you're a smoker and calculate how much you spend on, on, on smoking. And, and, for, and for this, you will save insurance companies money. Thank you very much. <laughs> Avoid debt. Debt of any kind. Your first aim is zero, Amoshe. Your first aim should be a position where you don't owe anyone any money. I've been like that three times in my life. Even now I owe money. Three times in my life, there's a time in 2009, January, I owed no one any money. I had paid off all my debts. I got back into debt for investment reasons. I found opportunities where I need to borrow because our businesses were going to make more money, okay? I only borrow that way. I know these days it's almost impossible, if, especially if you travel not to have a credit card. So I do have a credit card, but I pay it 100% every month. I use my credit card as a debit card. Banks are very smart. They tell you, oh, pay 20% and you can roll over. Calculate how much interest you're paying them, okay? That 20% on interest on your credit card, you can put that money into investment. The prudent way is pay off your debts. Aim to pay off your debts, then begin, begin saving. Savings in Kenya don't give you as much return as much interest you're paying. So, so instead of starting to, to save, pay off your debts first, okay? And debt should never be taken for consuming purposes. Do you know these days they are lending you money for holidays? Yeah. Don't borrow money for holiday. Why would you be borrowing money? You come back from holiday to pay a debt for consumption. Do you need to go for that holiday this year? The best holiday is to go shags. I don't have shags to go though. Go shags, spend time with your grandmother. It's the cheapest way. Okay? And you eat what they are eating. Okay, don't pay, don't, don't accumulate debt in a way to, to please the Joneses. Pay off your debt before you start investing. And if you're starting investing today, avoid debt entirely. Okay. Rent and save. I'm going to say two, two contradictory things today about homeownership and renting. 
In the beginning, I suggest my home. If you are renting, you call the landlord or the caretaker and tell them, come and fix this thing, isn't it? In the beginning, I urge you to rent and save, especially if you are young. Then, own a house after that. Use the savings that you put away to help you own a house. I normally encourage people not to buy built-up homes, but to buy land and build. Certainly, in the beginning, you'll end up living in an area you don't like. Isn't it? If you want to build currently, and you are, if, you are, if, if your idea is to live in Muthega or Karen or Runda, you cannot afford that, 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 that land. So initially, you have to start in a place where you are not very comfortable. But then you eventually, you'll take off the, the, the equity on that property and use it to buy that land in those particular places. In my 20s, I probably would have loved to live in Karen. There's no way I could have afforded to live there. Now I live in Karen and I don't have a loan on the home. It takes time to get there. Rent and sell, then buy a home. And, and the best way is to build. Kenya is one of, the, is one of the lucky countries that real estate returns are almost the highest in the world. I've been waiting for 30 years for this bubble to burst. 30 years. I bought land in Riruta, next to Precious Blood, adjacent there, in 2002. Just to give you an example of land. I bought land for 2 million shillings. And I have never done anything on it. I've been offered 24 million shillings on that same piece of land. That I've not even done, put in anything. Real estate in Kenya, even if you want one by 100, where, wherever in Kenya, this land in Namanga, please buy. Because in 10 years, the return on that land is going to be very big. It may be better to buy that land in Namanga, rent at the moment, keep renting, than buying a flat in Kileleshu. <laughs> And what is 10 years? 10 years is just the other day. Kibaki. Kibaki, when Kibaki came in. We all can remember. It's just the other day. 10 years. Okay? So diversify into home ownership when you have built a bit of wealth. And I'm not telling guys not to come to you. They, can, they will come eventually when they have saved money. You all know Benjamin Franklin. He says, industry, frugality are the true means to wealth. Work hard and live in a cheap manner then you'll build wealth. And he said that when he was a teenager. And that lesson still applies today. This, that idea is timeless. If you're frugal, you'll beat your neighbors. Okay. Don't smell what they're cooking and, and want to cook the same thing. <laughs> Invest wisely, know yourself. If you're not interested in doing research, and a lot of us, we get daunted by those financial figures and all that, put money in a balanced fund. A balance fund is a fund, many, there are many balance funds in this country. Uh, I think um, Britain has a balance fund where they invest both in the money market and the equi and equities for you. And you can put in money on a monthly basis. If you're not smart enough and you're worried about how to, to, where to invest your money, put money, 10 years a month in a balance fund. Then as that, that, after that, you start understanding, okay? I always recommend a passive conservative investment program for the first 10 years. And then you look, look long term. Don't, don't look at cash now that you're going to make tomorrow. I mean, two investment groups. The, com the first investment group we used to put, to put, we started 10 years ago, we used to put in 1,000 bob a month. That's what we used to put. Now we're putting 100,000 shillings a month. And we, have, we, we, we started as buddies and we have built, we have owned properties. Invest with your friends. First of all, it's fun and it bonds you together because as you grow older, friends disappear. Investment clubs tend to keep you guys together. It's true. Okay? Invest, invest with your buddies, then, th th then you're taking the risks together. So stock, uh, stock trading is not sustainable for yourself. P put it in a fund that is investing in stock because they'll do the, the, the work for you. Save more. Make more. As you make more money, save more. You can, we can create wealth just by saving. And I'm not saying all of us can be entrepreneurs. You can make wealth when you're employed just by saving. Okay? As, as you gain more experience, you, 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 now you understand the techniques of investment. Right now, I know much more about the techniques of trading than I knew 10 years ago, but I used to save. And I, I up to now, I still save. Relax mm -hmm. on, on charity. Start giving it when the money starts coming. Reinvest your dividends. Things that you make, don't spend them. Reinvest them. Keep reinvesting them. If your business is doing well, 